Everybody, everybody, it's Anthony Brogdon. I'm back at you, coming at you again. Strongly, stronger, strong is stronger than before because I got a guy on the channel today. He is a regular. See, because people, they become regulars when they are on their third occasion, and he's on his third occasion. And I, I say this to all my guests. I know that they know more than what they say in uh, the one hour that we are, you know, on it uh, in any one moment. So come on. Come on back. Share some more knowledge. Let people hear the stories. <laughs> and he is uh, very amenable to doing that. And I'm excited to have him on because everybody, I got to tell you something. He's a heavyweight. <laughs> this guy is huge. He's an expert. He <laughs> teaches this stuff every day. He done researched it. He know what he's talking about. And he comes back on the channel. He's very well thought of in his circles around the US of A. So uh, I'm excited. Uh, and, and I guess my excitement uh, it went to the point that I didn't tell you I'm Anthony Brogdon. <laughs> and that's who I am. I've been this way for quite a few years, some decades now. And I have found my calling in this strong inspirations. I truly enjoy doing this. Uh, my, uh, it helps me. Uh, my personality comes out. I think maybe you feel it. And it's always who I have been, but now I have a vehicle with my aim being to inspire, to educate and entertain. So come on, hit the subscribe button on the channel, hit the like button on this video. You liked the last two, you'll like this one for sure. Hit the notifications bell for when the videos come up, you get a ding, a smoke signal, a shock, the horn on your car, your dog, your cat, bow, bark, meow. Uh, you get a nudge, something. That there is some more history uh, that is available to you per strong inspirations. Uh, do that, my friends, and tell somebody too. Don't keep it to yourself. Uh, I, and I, I had a couple of people hit me up saying, hey, I, I really like what you're doing. I'm sharing this on my uh, social media page, Facebook. Uh, they retweet it out, you know, things of that sort. And and, and just by chance, I, 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 how about this, guys? I bet if you told a lady you're trying to, you know, hit on her or something like that, you like her, and you're an intelligent guy. But I believe if you told her you watched Strong Inspirations and you told her what it was about, that would be a feather in your hat. How about that? I, I believe that would work for you. So uh, did you watch the video I did? with the guy out of Hawaii. He is the state president of the NAACP chapter in Hawaii. Watch that video. Did you see the one, and I'm, I am I tell you, he, this was mind blowing, that I did with the first black mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama. Man, that guy, been he started, he got elected in 1972. Changed things around, made it a little more fair. And, and he lasted 30-some-odd uh, years. And now, at the age of 80, because when I interviewed him, his birthday was the day before. That's how I know. He uh, is on the city council there. Watch that video. Did you see the one I did with uh, the lady uh, in, uh, uh, let me give you one, who works at a, a museum in Connecticut, and the museum was once a school that it's a crazy dynamic. The school was predominantly for, for white students. It was a boarding school. Uh, a black kid slipped in the cracks and the white kid said, hey man, I, I don't think I wanna go there no more. She said, all right. And then turned the school completely for uh, African-American students. It don't have a good ending. They came at her so hard that in 17 months she had to close. All cause she wanted to educate students. And it wouldn't have had no problem if they could have come together. They wouldn't have in that. This is in Connecticut. Or how about the video I did with the guy? He is at uh, uh, the curator of a museum that was once a swimming pool rec center in Indiana. 
It was, you know, public pool, but they wouldn't let the black students or the black kids go. Eventually the things changed and now it's a museum uh, under the auspices of the uh, university there. Watch that video. And, and, and I, I got them coming at you uh, from all over the world. And that's what I'm gonna do for you, my friends. Now, uh, a couple housekeeping uh, things, you know, I, I'm always gonna ask you to watch my movie uh, business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. It's a documentary that I produced. Little old me. Took me three years. Uh, and it's, it's it's just on the rise of Black business in America. It's streaming on Amazon. I wrote this book. It's called Black Business Book. It's like the movie, but more facts. How about this? If you read my book and you don't learn nothing new, I give you your money back. A book with a money back guarantee. You ain't got to do nothing but send me a message. Hey, man, I do all that. And I'll just send you a cash app, you or whatever that you feel comfortable to say, oh, man, if you that thorough, then uh, I get your money back. And every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school. And last week, I donated 55 books to different schools across the country. And, and that really made me feel good. They get the book. They don't know. I put a little note in it. And they say, oh, man, I've had a couple of schools hit me back and ordered more copies. I know I'm on to something. Because my it's, it's not about the money per se. I, 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 that, that'll happen. But it's about helping to uh, enlighten people on some uh, stories of amazing achievement. And that's what this gentleman is going to talk about. So you can learn all about what I'm doing on um, the website, businessintheblack.net. Uh, I got one more thing to tell you. I got another project I'm working on. There are a couple of projects. One is I will soon be launching a line of uh, inspirational word sayings on wood plaques. It's called uh, Inspirations by Strong. So look for that. That'll be on the website. And uh, if you can, buy one of those, too. That would help, help in the cause. Now, you hear me use this word strong a lot. Uh, I, 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 it's my favorite word. Everything got some strong in it in my world. I try to be a strong guy. And uh, strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. He's a strong man, three times running. Oh, so this so good now. I'm happy he's back. Y'all gonna like this. Come on, introduce yourself. Thank you for being on Strong Inspirations. Well, thank you, Mr. Brogdon. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, I'm Calvin Schirmerhorn, professor of history at Arizona State University. And today I'd like to talk to you about Jacob Green. Jacob David Green was probably the most okay, remarkable hold on, hold on. abolitionist. I, I don't mean no you disrespect, heard but I gotta ask a couple questions. Just a couple questions mm -hmm. about you. You teach yeah. where? Arizona State University here in Tempe, uh, right uh, next to Phoenix, Arizona. And 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 uh, has school started? School has started. Okay. The campus is alive with people. You can see I'm in my office. You can see the books in the background there. Yeah. What what what, what subjects are you teaching this year? Uh, this year I'm teaching the American Civil War era, and I'm uh, teaching the first half of the United States History Survey, 1865. All right. Now, how, how did you decide to, to, to teach those topics? Uh, how does that come about, Mass? Yeah, so um, here in the, the history unit of the larger School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, um, we respond to students' needs and respond to what they want to take. And so um, there are many history majors who want to write a, a, do a capstone course, an independent uh, kind of history thesis. And so I'm teaching uh, two sections of that this semester. So students uh, research their, their senior thesis um, on the American Civil War uh, or Reconstruction era. Now, uh, you didn't teach that last semester. So for, for you to teach it this semester, do you have to, and I, I know it's a, a yes to the question, but <laughs> you have to do some pre-preparation so that you know what you're talking about and so on and so forth? How does that go? Yes. Yeah, I have to I have to prep for the class. Uh, it's an online class. And so instead of arranging a, a classroom that's a physical space, 
I kind of have to curate the digital space of the classroom. Uh, my students are from all over the country. I have a student in Hawaii. I have uh, students in New Jersey. And uh, I think I, I talked to another one in Michigan, but my man, my may, they be playing tricks on me. So yeah. um, they're all over the country. When, when you teach a class, so did you read a book before class or did you already know what you might want to tell them? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, I recorded the, the lectures, so I did have to read quite a bit before I videoed the lectures, um, but uh, history is always changing, and so I do kind of keep up with uh, the, the latest uh, developments in the field, and that's changed the way that the course has been uh, offered over time. Uh, what I taught several years ago may not be the most up-to-date uh, information oh, on really? the subject. So that's so how it goes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> how do you find the book that you teach from? Um, so I, again, I pay attention to the, uh, the major works in the field. So the last time I taught the uh, U.S. history to 1865, I used a conventional history book. Um, in 2020, Dinah Ramey Berry and another author published A Black Woman's History of the United States. And I'm going to use that as my textbook for this course. Uh, to really um, present the, that as the, the main text uh, for a course on U.S. history. And then, uh, you know, the, so students are, are reading that narrative rather than the traditional politics and economics, which I'll cover in the lectures. Uh, how does a person get an A in your class? They do all the work. How does that yeah. work, per se? Yeah, so um, for students doing writing a history paper, I look for uh, evidence, argumentation. Are you writing a, a compelling piece of argumentative nonfiction? Uh, do you have a thesis? Do you explain it uh, with evidence? Uh, have you read around the subject? And so uh, I, I evaluate students um, on whether they've kind of gone through the process of historical research using best practices, and then have they written a compelling essay? I got you. So I don't necessarily need to agree with them um, as far as their conclusions, but um, as long as they've gone through the, the process of uh, doing the research and presenting it compellingly, I think they would, uh, a student would earn an A doing that. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and, but you, do you get bored doing this uh, semester after semester or how does this keep you uh, intrigued? Well, you know, uh, since students pick their own topic, uh, every semester is different. And so I, I'm, I have students that, that do something new every semester in this course on the Civil War era. And that keeps it interesting. I had a student uh, email today asking for the, uh, the proceedings of the 1862 Illinois Constitutional Convention. Um, yesterday, I had a student um, talking or emailing, uh, sending me a draft about the um, Reconstruction era South Carolina elections and seeing how um, when African Americans you know, won their freedom in the Civil War, they enjoyed that freedom until about 1876. And then a very disciplined, conservative uh, white party in South Carolina took it back, took, took back the state and started dismantling those freedoms so that between 1882 and 1888, Black participation in politics plummeted by some like two thirds or three fourths. Um, and I know this isn't the subject for today, but uh, how do we understand that, right? We usually think of the Civil War as this great moment of freedom, right? Abraham Lincoln said it, this is a new birth of freedom uh, that uh, safeguards American government. But 10 years later, uh, this uh, new birth of freedom was under attack. And by the 1890s, South Carolina and most other states had passed constitutions that excluded black people from politics by some very ingenious means. And once they exclude black people from politics, they can close the schools, they can shut the, shut the career ladders down, um, keep people of African descent poor. And this is the, the history that uh, the, a consequence, a legacy of this struggle um, between these right conservative, um, you know, white supremacists and the freedom fighters that emerged during the Civil War. Yeah, uh, and I, I'll admit this to you, and I'll say it publicly. The, the, uh, the, the, from the other two times that you've been on the show, I could feel your compassion mm -hmm. and your empathy uh, for mm -hmm. the plight. Uh, but at, uh, does, does it ever bother you 
to hear these stories? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what drew me to the, the subject today, Jacob Green, was that he grew up across the Chesapeake Bay from where I grew up in Southern Maryland. Oh, really? um, he was born 209 years ago in Queen Anne County, born enslaved. His One of his earliest memories was that his mother was sold, his, his owner, um, Richard Tillman Earl, sold his mother to a slave trader named Woolfolk. Um, this, this Woolfolk was operating out of Baltimore, um, sending African Americans to Louisiana and reselling them. And so um, this was this was Jacob Green's reality, and it's deeply disturbing because we can all empathize with somebody growing up, you know, discovering the world around them, and then having that 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 harsh shock um, when he's only six years old. His father lived nearby, but um, when he wrote his memoir, he gave us to understand that his father was unavailable to take care of him. And so Jacob Green grew up on this landscape of slavery in Maryland in the 18 teens and 20s, uh, virtually as an orphan. Um, but he got by. He got by by being quick witted, um, by maybe doing a, a few things that were coloring, coloring outside the lines. And so on one occasion, he'd driven his owner, this owner, Earl, to Baltimore, where he was sitting as a, a Supreme Court judge. And uh, Jacob Green was only a teenager at the time, and he spied some sweet potatoes. He took the sweet potatoes, came back home, and Earl had found this, these stolen sweet potatoes, he thought. And he wrote a little message on a piece of paper. He said, go give this to the overseer, Mr. Cobb. Now, Jacob Green couldn't read at the time, but he knew that that, that message wasn't going to do him any good. So he went to a friend of his and said, hey, can you take this message? Uh, to the overseer, and uh, I'll cover for you, you know, in your work while you do that. Um, and so he did. And uh, the boy who took the, the message to the overseer got 39 lashes, which is what was on the piece of paper. And so Jacob Green got, a, got on by kind of dodging the, the, the you know, the, 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 the machine tooled violence on this plantation. Um, and he got along as well as he could. He, he worked on uh, on this, this plantation until uh, he was in his early 20s. His owner um, arranged a marriage to a woman named Jane. For him. Um, Jane was already, for him, for Jacob Green. Okay, let me stop um, Jane was already, Why did he do that? Yeah, because he had impregnated Jane. He probably raped Jane. Jane was pregnant with his child, so he forced her to marry Jacob Green so that the wife would be uh, less complaining ah, about you. what was going on. Now, Jacob Green you know, saw Jane as a human being. He didn't see her fundamentally as a damaged person. They um, were married for four more years, had a few children of their own. Um, then one day uh, he was tasked to go to the county seat at Centerville to do some errand. And when he came back, the owner had sold Jane uh, and sold their children. And so the, 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 you know, the, the integrity of a family under this condition was only as, as good as, a, as, as the owners would let it be, yeah. as these enslavers would let it be. And so uh, Jacob Green mourned Jane, but having a, a, his wife and children taken away from him, he decided, I'm not going to be enslaved anymore. So at 26 years old, he ran off to Pennsylvania, the Darby, Pennsylvania, just south of Philadelphia changed his name, uh, went to work, and started worshiping at uh, Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church there, okay, which is me, still I'm, there. Let me ask Darby, you this question. How did he run away? Mm -hmm. It was in the middle of the night. How, how did, how, do you know how his trail happened? Yeah, uh, he, he tells about it in his autobiography, which he published much later. And so what, what he would do is, is simply slip away. You, you, you run away over, under the cover of night and hope you get far enough from the property that the bloodhounds don't pick up your scent. Uh, he said other people who had run away from this plantation in Queen Anne County, the dogs had got them. And so he tried to throw them off his scent. And as, if, he can, if he can make good that escape over a night um, and kind of zigzag around the country, um, the, the, the distance was only about 90 miles from Queen Anne County to Darby, Pennsylvania. Oh, and really? so he could cover that pretty quickly. Yeah, cover it pretty quickly. Um, it would be, it's very different if you're trying to escape from Alabama, Georgia, yeah, right. 
right? But Maryland, Maryland sits on the border. And even though Queen Anne County is on the eastern shore of Maryland, it's, you know, it's low, flat area. There's no mountains to go over. You just kind of have to take the road up. And a, a lot of uh, people running away, he didn't have the Underground Railroad. There wasn't, Harriet Tubman wasn't around yet. Um, but that's where Harriet Tubman had led people, would lead people away from. And so he managed to get to, to Darby, Pennsylvania, and he found some friends. He found some people who knew he'd ran away, but who said, well, your secret will be safe with me. Right, he got, uh, he, How did he know where to go? Mm -hmm. uh, it was luck. <laughs> it was luck and good sense. He had been uh, driving. He had been a groom. So he'd been taking care of horses and he'd been driving. Uh, Richard Tillman Earl to and from Baltimore. So he knew the roads up to Baltimore. And once you know you, the roads up to Baltimore, you can you can probably find out which roads lead north of Baltimore, across the, the to the ferry over the Susquehanna River, and the, the path to Philadelphia. There were no bridges over the river at that point. And so as long as he could get clear of the Susquehanna River and maybe have a little bit of luck outrunning uh, patrols and, and kidnappers who prowled the border prowled the borderlands for runaways, he could make it safe to Darby, Pennsylvania. Did he have close calls? Oh, he, yes, he did have close calls. And he he had uh, he, he mentions other people who had run away who um, were killed um, running away. And so it was by the grace of God and good luck that he was able to get free. He didn't stay free, however. He, he worked for a few years in Pennsylvania his owner uh, was bankrupt, went bankrupt. He lost his job and then somehow his identity slipped. His owner um, caught up with him, put him in an iron collar, um, marched him to the nearest slave market as he tells it and sold him to an owner in Tennessee. And so Green has just bounced from this, this, this place of relative safety to this new place of peril. The Tennessee owner didn't really want him for his labor. It wanted him because he was probably increasing in value as a human commodity. He hired him out to an owner in New Orleans, you know, down the Mississippi River. Um, didn't take Green long to run away from that owner. Uh, he was caught, um, sold uh, to another owner in Kentucky. And by 1848, he had spied a, a, a way to get free of this owner on a Ohio River cotton ship, uh, cotton uh, steamboat, I should say. And so he jumped down in the hold of this cotton uh, steamboat on the Ohio River and made it to a safe port and somehow got connected to the Underground Railroad uh, that helped him get to freedom in Canada by 1848. So he became a, he ran away three times. Uh, he was caught twice, the third time. He wasn't gonna be caught again. He crossed the border and lived in Toronto for another 13 years, um, doing, doing um, probably brick making, masonry work, and he learned to read and write. Mm. Let's, let's go back and just a say, you said that he was working for an owner, uh, I guess in Maryland before they found his identity. Who did they think he mm -hmm. was if they didn't think he was a runaway slave? Well, uh, many, many people who ran away, I'll give you the example of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass was known as Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, also on the Eastern Shore, and Frederick Douglass might well have crossed paths with Jacob Green. When Frederick Douglass ran away, the same year as Jacob Green did in 1838, he put on a sailor's uniform. He had procured a, a pass saying he was somebody else, and he uh, took the train up to Philadelphia, took another one to New York, and eventually made it to uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now, in New Bedford, he got a job he got several jobs uh, laboring, um, but his his um, friend said, you know, they're looking for Frederick Bailey. And uh, eventually he adopted the name Frederick Douglass as a way to kind of throw off the trail. So he could be Frederick Douglass in New Bedford. And yeah, maybe people would be suspicious of him. But as long as he was living under that um, uh, under that name, then he was less likely to be apprehended. Jacob Green never said that he never said which name he was he was knew which identity he had assumed, but it was it, it was not uncommon to do that. Well, okay, so you got another name. Did they have pictures of the of, of him at that era to say, okay, you look like the guy in the picture? Are there pictures of him? 
No, but there are, that's an interesting question because there are verbal pictures. And so the, uh, the runaway ads from this, uh, this period, if you picked up a newspaper um, in Philadelphia or, or you know, Baltimore, you'd have a whole section of runaway ads saying, Jacob Green ran away and he is this description. He has this scar on his face. He, he talks in this manner and was last seen wearing these clothes and he might be headed in this direction. And so some of these, uh, these ads are quite detailed. And so, you know, the country was a lot smaller in those days. You know, you're not talking about a, a city, uh, Baltimore isn't gonna be a city of a million people. It's gonna be a city of about a hundred thousand people. And then in the, and I'll, don't, don't, don't quote me on that. I'll, I have to look that up, but it's gonna be a lot smaller. And yeah, so sure. if, you, if you're looking for somebody you know, and it's a face-to-face -face community. They're not everyone's zooming around in cars, you know, on their on their screens. I mean, they're talking, they're looking around, and most people's interactions are word of mouth, face to face, and so it's it's kind of hard to to remain anonymous for very long. Because uh, he's 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 there. He's got a job, so he's got to go have some place to stay. How, how does yeah. he find lodging along the way and, and so on and so forth? I mean, who would rent to him, that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, in Pennsylvania, uh, he worshiped at Mount Zion uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. And members of the AME Church welcomed him in. They probably knew enough not to ask him too many awkward questions to say, oh, where, where are you really from? And he may have confided in people saying, I am, I'm from this place. I am this person. This is my story. And they said, uh, you are not enslaved as far as we are concerned. And so in that community, he could have a measure of safety. But after that was compromised and he, uh, he was seized by his owner, they weren't going to take second chances. The owner, um, Earl, sold him again. And, and the, the, um, other, the next owners probably didn't know that he'd run away, um, but they kept pretty strict watch over people of African descent, watching for this kind of behavior. But at that point, Green said, you've taken my family from me. You've taken my mother, you've taken my father, you've taken my, my wife, Jane, and my children. I, I don't have a lot to lose here. And so that's why he was able again and again to persist in running away and eventually making it to Canada, uh, which was a British colony at the time. Um, I, I, so he, his life is in constant fear. When he's on the run, is isn't yes, yes. That's a great way of putting it. And so you're talking about you know strength and and being strong. He had to have considerable strength of character to bear up under all that. Because unlike so many people, unlike Frederick Douglass, he didn't have a lot of allies. Who um, he didn't work for an abolitionist organization that we know of. Um, when Frederick Douglass ran away. Um, three years later, he was working for an abolitionist group, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, as a paid agent, and that network protected him. Um, Jacob Green, by the time he got to Toronto, um, he had to fend for himself. He had to make, you know, kind of make his own network and make his own friends. And that's why the next part of this, of his story is remarkable. Yeah. In 1861, the U.S. Civil War breaks out, and he says, how can I best serve the cause of freedom? I'll go to England and I will try and convince English people to support the, the United States against the Southern Confederacy. So in 1861, he takes a, a ship. Somehow he gets from Toronto, probably to Liverpool, England. And by 1862, he's living in, a, in the city of Manchester, uh, Britain's third largest city. Um, he had married, remarried a woman named Ellen Booth. Um, he's working in a, in a masonry trade. And he's meeting other people who are religious dissenters. You know, we, we are thinking about, you know, the, the church, the queen, the, the, and, and the, the English authorities over the church, right? The, the, the monarch is the head of the Church of England. But over in England, there are lots of um, dissenters and evangelicals who are preaching up revivals and preaching up, um, up um, Kind of religious enthusiasm in the 1860s. And so Jacob Green met Methodists and Congregationalists and Wesleyans. And they took him, uh, they took him east in England 
Um, and he started speaking in 1863. He started speaking in Congregationalist churches against slavery. And it was rather a, a remarkable journey because here's this person who'd been enslaved, who'd ran away, who's you know, learned to read and write along the way, uh, working in, these, in, in this masonry field. And now he's speaking, probably the only black person in these towns in Yorkshire, England, speaking to 100, 200, or 500 people at a time in these Congregationalist churches. And they're listening. Um, what we know about Jacob Green from this time and, and while he's in Yorkshire is that there are newspaper uh, reports of these speeches and they're saying, he knows what he's talking about. He's very persuasive. And there's a, another part of, this, uh, of this, this story that is that Yorkshire, England doesn't mean a whole lot to people outside of the UK. But inside the UK, Yorkshire is known as the, the industrial um, Midlands of England, uh, just you know, the, the north of England, the North Midlands. And this is a place where there are mill towns um, dotting the countryside. And so this is a place of heavy industry. So Green is, is talking, is, is speaking in these evangelical churches, and he's speaking to people who understand hardship because they have been through this industrial revolution, or at least their parents have. They come off the farm into the factories and deal with a significant loss of freedom and independence. They're wage workers. Okay. In good economic times, you know, the, 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 uh, the factory uh, owner wants them to work harder in bad economic times, delays them off. Let, let me, let me so stop you there. Jacob, I mean, let me stop yeah, you there. Uh, yeah. Question just came up. Okay, you mm -hmm. said he's speaking. Okay, I'm at the mm -hmm. church. I'm sitting in the pew. And then I raise uh -huh. my hand and say, let me tell you who I am. And I want everybody here to hear me. Uh, I, is that mm -hmm. kind of odd? And at some point, he uh, he does it so often that, yeah. that now they asked him to come speak. How, how does that begin in the process now? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, yeah, he he goes to these congregational churches and he meets the minister and he's fairly conspicuous. I mean, he might show up with with Ellen, his wife, and be the only black person in, in the audience. Uh, and the, the minister will say, well, what's your story? And he starts to, uh, speaking. And then the minister says, we need to get you in front of a crowd. Oh, I and so you. they arranged his tours. Right. And so they arrange tours. Now, this industrial Midlands is very well um, connected through railroads. And so in the first in 1863, Jacob Green starts speaking about 30 miles from Manchester off the. So we take the train um, to Oldham or he take the train to uh, Heckmanwike or he take the train to to Hopton or one of these places. He'd get off the train and they'd, they'd receive him in their Sunday school. And he'd speak to us uh, in the Sunday school to an audience of 100, 200, 300 people. And usually it was presided over by a, a white officiant who they would elect and say, all right, Mr. Smith is going to preside today. Our special guest is Jacob Green. Jacob Green, Mr. Green, what do you have to say? Okay. He might speak for an hour or two oh, uh, really? in this day and age, right? Yeah, there's there there's no you know there's no mass media, so it's not like you're going to a movie. You yeah, want to be right. entertained in the evening, and don't have the 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 uh, the the cost of a theater ticket. Go to a speech. Go to a you know go to a public event like this. And so Green would speak for an hour or two at a clip, and then people would vote. They take a vote on whether he was persuasive. And over and over, as he's speaking in these Congregationalist churches, he's getting a unanimous verdict that, yes, he is persuasive. He talks about the American Civil War. He talks about his experience of slavery. And he says, you cannot support the Southern Confederacy. And there's another angle to this, too, because in this, in this heavy industrial Woolens district, they are supplying the U.S. Army. Uh, with and they're supplying the Confederate Army with woolens, with horse blankets, and things like this. And in 1864, he settled in a town called Heckmanwike, which I'm sure no one in the audience has heard of. But this is this is synonymous with the blanket business, which is synonymous with shoddy. Um, shoddy is a technical term for recycled wool. If you okay. want to make cheap blankets in the 1860s, you can use new wool, which is fairly expensive, or recycled clothing, you pound it up, mash it up, make it into blankets. The problem is the old wool, uh, the fibers are damaged and the thing comes apart. And so shoddy at this time is uh, becomes a synonym for substandard product, yeah, I got you. right? We still use this today. I got you. 
And so by 1864, his supporters are saying, Mr. Green, you have to write this down. You have to publish this, this story. And so he writes down his story, including all the uh, all the details, all the things that may actually have, might have embarrassed him. Um, and he publishes it in a town called Huddersfield. All right, let me stop you there. Let stop you there. Uh, mm -hmm. First question is, do they eventually pay him to speak? Uh, yes and no. Oh, okay. So they take up a collection. And initially, it's like a, they take up a collection to pay for the venue. Um, eventually, by 1865, 1866, they take up a collection, and he may get a portion of that. Okay. But for this time, he is probably working a day job, um, doing masonry or other kind of work, and then speaking in the evenings. He may get a train ticket paid for by uh, the, the collection, but it's not as if he's earning a, a fee for speaking. Yeah, not so honorary he's really or something doing like this. that. No, I mean, he might okay. he might be invited to a meal afterwards, but in terms of making a living from speaking, no, he, he, he there's only there, there's a there's one bright motivation for this, and that is stopping the evil that he had experienced enslaved as a, oh, as I love it. I love a it. child and a young man. Let, let me ask you this question. And, uh, because he's mm -hmm. making a name, does he also make it into the local newspaper to say, hey, Y'all have heard about him. He's going to be at this church. And now more people are showing up, that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. And so by 1864, the, his friends are putting notices in newspapers saying, Jacob Green is going to speak at the Working Man's Institute in Bradford or, or speaking at the, the Temperance Hall in Chester or, or speaking at this place in Sheffield. And hey, show up and support, you know, sh show up and, and hear what he has to say. And so they're, they're creating this publicity around him. And after he published his autobiography called Narrative of the Life of J.D. Green, if you Google that, you can actually get the text. Uh, okay, um, let me stop no you there. You say he, you he published that. it or someone published it or he, because he printed the copies. How did that happen? Do you know? He went, yeah, he went to a, a, a printer um, huh. in Huddersfield as, as that was a job printer. And so he, uh, you can almost imagine him getting off the train. He's got this manuscript, right? And he goes to the, the job printer named Henry Fielding, and he says, I have this job for you. I want you to print me, you know, print me this, you know, th this narrative, this autobiography. And uh, the printer is a pretty shrewd person. So he just says, all right, I'll print this for you. You know, he'll take his, his fee. And then on the cover of it, he prints 8,000. That is... He purports to have printed 8,000 copies of this narrative. Wow. Um, but in doing some research, there's only a handful left uh, that are known about. One of them's in the Library of Congress. Um, and the, I don't think that 8,000 were ever printed. Oh. <laughs> um, they're extremely rare. But um, that's why if I say, you know, if you Google narrative of the life of J.D. Green, you can get, you can see a copy. You can see a facsimile of this. Uh, he may have sold it, you know, for uh, to defer some of the costs of printing it. Um, but it's clear that he cared enough about getting this message out that he was um, he was willing to bear that expense. And it, it is very rare in this day and age for a person in his position to actually earn money um, writing or, or earn money speaking. I guess it's kind of similar today where. You know, you've got you've got successful offers, but most authors are not, you know, right. paying the bills right. through the the royalties and the proceeds of right. their uh, of their craft. And so, um, by 1865, uh, the U.S. Civil War is over. The uh, the Thirteenth Amendment's making its way through the Congress, and he has achieved his object. Right? He's seen what his ancestors had not seen, which was the downfall of chattel slavery in the United States. And so. Um, when the news comes to where he's staying in Heckenwijk, in Yorkshire, of Abraham Lincoln's assassination, the town mourns, and the 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 leading businessmen and politicians and, and clergymen of the town invite him to a memorial uh, for for Abraham Lincoln in the Masonic Hall in Heckenwijk in May of 1865, and this is probably his his moment in the sun because. He, he is the only black man among a dozen speakers at this Masonic Hall, which still stands in Heckmanwike, 
And he gave a speech alongside the, the gentleman that owned the, the, the blanket factory and the, the minister of Hop, uh, uh, the minister of the, uh, of the George Street Congregationalist Church and, and all these other important gentlemen. And I think after that, uh, he decides my work's done. His, his health starts to fail him. By this time, he's in his early, his early 50s. Um, but in the 19th century, people didn't live as long. We didn't have as good medical care. And so by 1860, late 1865, early 1866, he is giving a farewell tour. And he changes his message slightly. He said, slavery may be done with, but racism remains. And so here's what you need to know about racism. And he takes apart this theory of separate creation of black and white separate creations and black inferiority by giving a biblical argument saying, I, I, I've heard this, I, I've heard these ideas um, that black and white people were created separately. Go read your Bible. It's not true. Unless you want to argue for a second creation. He said, even if you look at the, the race of Jesus Christ, he says, you're not going to see a white man. He said, G Jesus was probably not a white man. He was white enough to save your souls. He's black enough to save the soul of Jacob Green speaking before you. And so he gives this very kind of at the same uh, folksy and eloquent and theologically complex argument against racism, um, kind of segueing to that theme because he realizes this is the big problem facing um, black people in America and in the United Kingdom where they had very, very tight restrictions against people of African descent. Well, uh, uh, for a guy like him, he, he took chances in life. It, 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 we, we, we sum that up? Yeah, yes, yeah, he took, he, he was not risk averse, all right? So uh, when he saw an opportunity to, to move up, to move over, to, to kind of get the message out, he took it. Uh, he he published this autobiography that was kind of that bared all the secrets. Uh, he he certainly was a risk taker, but by 1866 he decides uh, my time is done in Britain. I'm going back, and so oh really? Uh, his wife Ellen Booth stays behind in Heckman White. Yes, yeah, she uh, she remarried the following year, and um, from all the research that I've done, and I've that I've been able to do with other people who know this area, he probably went back to Canada and remained there for the rest of his life. Uh, when I, but the other part of when I say take chances, did he ever, uh, and like when he got caught on after mm -hmm. the runaway, uh, is there a story where he got beat severely? Uh, because you mentioned, and that's one question, but you also mentioned there were things that were embarrassing. What was embarrassing to him? <laughs> so, so oh, um, he tells about this this early um, this kind of teenage love with a, a woman named Mary, probably a few years older than him, and he fell for Mary head over heels. This is back when he's living in Queen Anne County, Maryland, and he evokes this scene where Mary was a cook or kitchen helper at this Needwood plantation in Queen Anne County, and so. Being a teenager in love, he decides he's going to prove his love for her. Mary was dating this man named Dan, probably not too much older than either of them. And so, um, so well, Jacob Green stop. goes. Mary, to Mary the is black, right? She's a slave. Yes, yes, okay. she's enslaved as well. And so, um, so, so Jacob Green goes into the kitchen one day. He he's got a length of rope. He slings one end over a kitchen raft, rafter. He ties a noose. He slips it over his neck while she's sitting there on a break smoking. He stands up on a stool. He ties up the rope. Now he's got the noose around his neck. He's got a stool between him and the ground. He says, Mary, I've got to prove my love to you. Um, I'm going to hang myself if, if you, you know, if, if you can't see how much I, I love and, 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 and respect you. And she just sits there smoking. She goes, uh, you know, hang if you're fool enough. Well, at one of these inopportune moments, uh, a dog comes in chasing a cat, knocks the stool from underneath him. And now he's just hanging there, right, in the kitchen. And he's, he's saying, Mary, Mary. And she says, you got yourself into this. You can get yourself out. The next thing 
he remembers is he's partially asphyxiated. He's looking up. There's Mary. There's a white physician. People are looking over at him going, what the heck were you doing, oh, Jacob Green? Really? And so it's those kinds of details. Yes. that, And so it's, uh, you know, he never, he never dated Mary. But it, it's an interesting story because he's willing to bear that for an audience. Right. Uh, if you write an autobiography, usually you're going to cut out the embarrassing oh, part. Yeah, sure, sure. But but here he was, kind of putting his his own mortification out there for a reading audience. And and Mary and Dan's um, romance ended in tragedy just a little while later. Um, you know, in some in a an incident in a barnyard, um, one of the owner's daughters is assaulting Mary. Um, Dan sees this. He grabs a pitchfork. He ends the life of the of the uh, the assailant, uh, and then runs away. Mary is distraught, drowns herself in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, eventually, the Dan is caught by the owner, and this is the you know he just he's executed in front of the in front of the whole plantation, and, and Jacob Green is made to watch along with everybody else. Oh. There's not a law in Maryland that will convict him. Uh, that convict the owner for doing this and so Whoa. it's and so that's this is the this is jacob green the storyteller saying this this is what this is what slavery does it twists and and disfigures every, every human emotion every every good aspect of humanity right because it's not enough for for mary to just decide who she wants to to date who she wants to marry but she has to to deal with these these assaults from these white owners and their sons and whoever else is in the neighborhood and if a black man raises his hand or raises a pitchfork against it it's curtains right yeah. there's there, there's no going back i i think the other thing that comes to mind and uh, and you you are on point with this is that there was some normality a slight amount to even the yeah. lives of the enslaved because how yes. is this guy with all this other stuff he got to think about has even got mm -hmm. a moment to even care about somebody to prove his uh, his like to how, how, you 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 follow yeah. there's a question there yeah yeah well that's the that that's I think um, Jacob Green's genius as an author he's he he he's able to convey that that it, if you're enslaved you're not a slave you don't have that slave mindset you never had that. He was saying here, this is right. This is a constraint. This is a pretty big constraint. Yes. This may be a constraint that en ends my life quickly. But he talks about the, the frolics and the dances that he'd go to and how, you know, he, he tried to impress the ladies on the dance floor. He uh, he had a, an hold aunt. On, hold on. He got I got a, a nice a frolic while okay. he was enslaved. Yes. Yes. Now there's the, now this was not approved by the the owners. So, oh really? Okay. Um, so it's it's kind of like well let's meet out in this cabin in the woods here, and everybody you know if you can get a horse you know take the horse, uh, you'll bring it back at two o'clock in the morning and no one will be the wiser. But uh, oh. so he talks about, about this kind of clandestine social life that people who were enslaved in Queen Anne County, Maryland had. And you can you can kind of glimpse, right, what's going on, you know, what people were, yeah, sure they have to to use certain language and, and do certain work, but at night, if they can sneak away, they can have the social life. Oh, really? um, the same was true with many uh, black congregations as well. So so Green, he tells us, is a very short narrative that he published. It's only about 30 or 40 pages. It's not, it's not very long. Um, Frederick Douglass' second autobiography runs into about 350 pages. But this, this is a very short autobiography, but it gives a flavor of some of the self-directed activities, some of the things that um, enslaved people did you know, below the, the notice of the owners. Now, oh, yeah. in this particular dance that he went to, it didn't end well. <laughs> oh, really? Um, but, you know, the, the, these stories never do. Well, so he, so again, you've got picture the 17 year old, 16, 17 year old who wants to go to the dance to impress the ladies. He doesn't have the proper clothes. So he borrows a, a, a handkerchief from an aunt. He, he cuts it up to, to make a little tie. 
he asked her to sew him some, you know, sew him some clothes that are a little bit more fashionable than what he's wearing um, to care for these horses. And then he wants to seem like he's got a little bit of means. And so he saved up these big copper pennies, these big large cents, and he adds to them a, a number of washers or slugs, right? So he's got this pocket full of 50 coins. And really? I did the calculation. This, this would actually weigh about 13 pounds. Now you can't dance with 13 pounds of coins in your pocket. Yeah. So he doesn't. He doesn't know that. So he starts dancing around, having a, a good time. The coins are jingling in his pocket. People start looking at him going, there's Jacob Green, right? Now, all of a sudden, his, his trousers tear, his coins fall out, his slugs fall out on the floor, and everybody starts laughing at him because he's, he's done the put on and or he's, put, he's tried to, to project himself as this person of, you know, maybe some means. It all comes apart. So he's mad. He's mad enough to eat snakes. He he bursts out of this this frolic. He goes and looses all the horses. That is, he unties the horses, and and then everybody's ride's gone. And so this ends up um, very badly for many of the dance goers who now have to chase their horses down, uh, or else take a take a chance and run for it. Um, he has, he himself comes back with this tired you know tired old horse and uh he he knows that he's going to get in trouble too so he just lets all the horses out of the barn goes and pretends to fall asleep and you know is woken up the next morning by the the owner coming in going where are all the horses and you know he makes up a story about that too so oh, it's really? it's jacob green kind of telling telling about some of the things that went on you know below the notice of of owners and, and below the notice of white people that kind of got got him and got others through the these hard times how, how does uh, i mean why is he trying to uh, for lack of a, a better word i'm trying to show off when everybody's in the same boat uh, how are they going to say oh man you exactly. got money and we <laughs> none of us got any how, how, <laughs> you, you follow my question mm -hmm. yeah that's i mean that but there there it is so jacob green just puts it out there as if to say, you figure this out, right? Oh. But uh, in fairness, in, in fairness, there were a lot of enslaved people who had a little bit of money, oh, um, yeah, enough yeah. enough to spend. Yeah. So uh, it, in and it, it might be uh, so for him, it might be getting a tip for doing something. So somebody comes to the house, right? His his owner's property. It. He might fetch he might fetch their horse for them and get a few coins. This is an old tradition. Okay. And sometimes the, uh, uh, a, you know, sometimes a visiting, you know, gentleman say will tip or even over tip uh, the, the, the enslaved people to show how magnanimous he is. And so, you, they, you know, you get a, a few coins in your pocket by doing that. Some enslaved people actually worked for wages that their owners or enslavers stole from them. Right. But maybe gave a portion back to just right. say, all right, you keep working. Right. Um, and in cities like Richmond, Virginia, they actually were industries that thrived on this. So tobacco factories employed uh, enslaved workers to, you know, twist the tobacco or flavor to, to the, the tobacco. Now, now they paid the wages to the owner. But in order to get the, the workers to work, they said, if you can exceed your quota you get cash at the end of the day or end of the week okay and so they held out those little incentives and so some people actually were able to save up enough to buy themselves yeah. buy relatives and uh, just to bring this back around to green yeah. where he spoke in sheffield england this was a place where frederick douglas and henry box brown spoke and henry box brown had been enslaved in right. richmond had bought had bought his family, um, or at least rented his family. Um, and when that fell through, he ran away. But he was able to actually rent a house with this overwork money. And so enslaved people did have a, um, a means of generating income, although it was you know, a, a tiny fraction of what their work was worth. Yeah, sure. And those wages, that labor value was stolen by the enslavers. Uh, okay, um, I guess as we kind of um, come to a close, uh, 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 let me ask this question. 
within that dynamic of the enslaved, there is mm -hmm. some uh, uh, people who are a little better off. Yeah. There are some who are uh, better off because they work in the big house. What what yeah. what makes one, you, you've alluded to it, but can you give me mm -hmm. some other ideas of somebody being a little better off? Yes, that's that's a great, great question, observation. Usually you're better off um, the more skilled you were or the more well-placed uh, you were in, um, it, it, you know, on a on an estate or in a, a work environment. So being a groom that that took care of horses, uh, Jacob Green or a driver, Jacob Green was better off because he had more opportunities to get resources, whether it's those sweet potatoes that he was able to get in Baltimore, I got you. tips for getting. So, <clears throat> excuse me, field laborers would be at the bottom of that um, hierarchy. Although um, there's a, a, a great recent book by Professor Justine Hill Edwards um, called Unfree Markets. And she noticed that in South Carolina, even those field workers would hold back a little bit of cotton, save up a little bit of cotton so that they could sell it um, you know, on the sly to generate a little bit of income. Okay. So there was, there was all, right? So there's always a, a little bit of, of room to generate some income. And a lot of enslavers would permit um, people to um, raise turkeys and chickens uh, to sell the eggs, to go market their vegetables. And in some cases, enslavers were in debt to their own enslaved people uh, because they had borrowed the eggs, borrowed the chicken, you know, oh, something really? like this. And so there was all these, these these kind of informal economies going on right beneath the surface. And so that's how you would have people who were enslaved who owned property, um, whether it was that little that that garden, uh, that that's uh, that you know those chickens or, or those guinea fowl, or yeah. if it's like hey, Jacob Green, he might owe, own a little bit of money. Yeah. Um, and this is this some of some enslaved people who were working in trades uh, uh, were able to generate a lot of money while still working while enslaved. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I guess the last question: How did you find out about him in the first place? So uh, I found out about him when I was researching uh, my dissertation um, about 15, 16 years ago. And he, his, uh, Jacob Green was puzzling because he didn't seem to, to fit any of the categories of other people in, who had written autobiographies. And so Frederick Douglass's autobiography is, is elegant. It's beautiful. It's, it tells the story of someone who freed himself through literacy. He learns to read and he can no longer be enslaved. And it's just, it's a wonderful work of American literature. Jacob Green, right? He's telling these stories where he's embarrassing himself and causing, causing trouble, um, you know, to other people who are enslaved. And he didn't kind of fit in with this, uh, this kind of art or craft of, of Black autobiography. Um, but this summer, I was actually able to, I was in England this summer, I was actually able to visit the places in Yorkshire where he had preached oh, really? and to see the churches, yes, to see the churches and the buildings that still stand today and how some of them have been repurposed as well. Uh, I, want, I guess I got one more question on that same note. Mm -hmm. So you, you're doing your research uh, and somewhere in a paragraph, this guy's name pops up. Mm -hmm. Then you say, wow. And then you Google it and you find more as a result of his name popping up there. Yes. And that's that's where I, I found the narrative of the life of Jacob, of J.D. Green, which is on the it, it's been curated by the University of North Carolina's library. And so it's on their website um, and it's and they've got a nice little introduction to it. And then digging deeper. I went into um, newspapers from that are published in Yorkshire and published in Manchester, uh, and found uh, found newspaper articles about him. And I actually asked some local historians there in Yorkshire, in Huddersfield, and elsewhere. Did you know about Jacob Green? And then they went on and looked for articles and right, found articles you. and let me know about that. And then through that, I met a. a, a a researcher at the University of Edinburgh, uh, Hannah Rose Murray, who'd actually um, has done this beautiful map of mapping black abolitionists in Britain. 
And so when I look at this map, I can see all the other abolitionists, all the other African-Americans who had toured this section of Yorkshire and gave these speeches from, um, for, including Frederick Douglass um, from the 1830s until the end of the century. And um, even people like Ida B. Wells traveled you. to England to, to do anti-lynching campaigning uh, in the late 19th century and was right there where Jacob Green had been. Um, but many years later, um, saying, look, Britain, you cannot you cannot tolerate, you cannot support, you cannot be allied with a United States that tolerates lynching yeah. of black people. And so, so yeah, it's that accumulation of evidence. And that's partly how the, you know, the, how the historical enterprise works. You, you look for more and more context, right? And so uh, I had a, a student many years ago um, here at Arizona State University who did her honors thesis on Jacob Green's Maryland experience and looked in the uh, the records for the names of the enslavers and found some of the names of the enslavers there in the census and other records in, in Queen Anne's County, Maryland. Is, is that, uh, have you thought to write a book about this or is there a book about kind of what you've told us? Yeah, I would memoir. like to write a book about, yeah, I would like to write a book about it. Um, I've I prepared a um, an article about looking for Jacob Green in Yorkshire and what has become of all these places that in which he spoke because um, the, these buildings haven't gone away, but they have been repurposed. Yeah, sure. Um, and so so the, the, the main church uh, that he probably attended and spoke at in his adopted home of Heckmanwike is now a mosque. And so I called up the, the, uh, the mosque and said, Hey, did you did you know that Jacob Green spoke here? And they said, no, we didn't even know who Jacob Green was. But it's interesting to see now this town in Yorkshire that used to be a mill town is now it still has you know heavy industry, but it's changed as Britain has changed. Um, and now instead of you know being you know mostly Congregationalist Methodist and Church of England. Um, maybe a third of the, the town is now Muslim. And so you would expect the, uh, yeah. that some of these old church buildings have become mosques. Yeah. Um, I went and, and looked for uh, looked at one of the, the places he spoke um, in um, another town in Yorkshire. Um, it's now a motorcycle um, repair shop. Okay. Um, this, this old Congregationalist church is now in an, in an, in an industrial, uh, area right. and it's flanked by other indu industrial, um, you know, businesses. Right, right, sure. But here it is. There's the church. It's now they're wow. now selling motorcycles out of the church. Wow. So, yeah. You know. uh, yeah. I, I guess on a personal note, you got to be excited that you found this and that this could, mm -hmm. could uh, because no one else is talking about it. Could this define your mm -hmm. career somehow as? You did something that nobody else done, or this is kind of commonplace among you PhD professors. Yeah, it's it's more. Uh, I would say it's more commonplace. Oh, really? We, okay. We tend, to, we tend to look for uh, we tend to look for subjects that haven't been fully explored yet. I got so you. I got you. When I was fa I was fascinated by Jacob Green, and, and no one had gone back and looked at where he actually was in England, and so. I don't know if that'll define a career. I don't know how many yeah. people want to read about Jacob Green, but I would like to publish this as a book. Yeah, at it's, some point. it's a very interesting story, you know, all this angle. Thank you. Uh, I, my, my last question, is, is there a question that I have not asked you in this regard? Something that you wanted to about, about Jacob Green, uh, something that he said, he was a joke um, teller. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. One one uh, literary caller, scholar called him a, a, a trickster, um, but I, I I don't know if there. I think you've asked all, all the, yeah, the pertinent, right. really good questions. Right. And the I guess I guess I would just say that the reason I, I I gravitated toward Jacob Green and why his story is worth telling is because it it shows the grit and determination of somebody who lived their life as far as we can tell based on a principle of of, of, of opposing an evil, that he couldn't, he couldn't just live peaceably in Toronto having run away from slavery 
there's something inside him that compelled him to go to a, a distant land and tell strangers, this is a moral evil that concerns you as well. Right. And I so if you. we take a step back and, and say, this is, you know, this is, you can say, well, this is African-American history. I would say, no, this is actually the center of American history. That Jacob Green is not a character that's sort of off on the perimeter somewhere. He's somebody worth studying because he's a sign of the times. I got you. His personal reflections on the, the evils of both of slavery and racism that he experienced um, are kind of a, a message to us to say, look, if this is still a, a problem, it's not simply an artifact of the past of someone who was born 209 years ago. This is something that characterized us. This is something in the national DNA I that we you. have to work against. I love so it. I would just, I would leave it there. I love it. Yeah, right on, right on. Thank you so much for that story. And uh, everybody, this is what I do. I told you you're gonna like it, because I, 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 if if you don't get that else out of it, there's dynamics to it all, and and he he, he expressed uh, this guy's dynamic. Uh, everybody, hit the subscribe button to Strong Inspirations, where we let the people do the talking, the experts, those who know, those who teach it, and others. Hit the like button on this video, hit the notifications bell, and tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. And uh, to you, I say this once again, you are, you are regular on <laughs> Strong Inspirations. And one day I'm going to be in Arizona, I'm going to come by, and we, you know, shake hands, and I'd love to do it. Uh, and, and, and I say this with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind, keep finding them stories, tell them. You 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 you're doing something special there. This is happening. Thank you. And I can feel it. Uh, uh, and I don't know how I met you, man, but I'm so happy because you taught me <laughs> a bunch. I don't know. I and you and you like and you come on too. So thank you for that. Everybody <laughs> with that, I'll say pleasure. bye bye. We out. Well, thank you, Mr. Brogdon. Yep. It was a pleasure speaking with yep. you. Thank you.